Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. David Niven in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a story based on fact, the true report of a man who had everything going for him. But since all his dealings were illegal, it became necessary to move around more frequently than was usual. It's called Grand Theft. Our star, Mr. David Niven. Hey, Hap, what's the rush? Well, not much time, Harlow. For what? Why, to enter that Autolite family charity drawing? Ah, uh, you're right, Hap. And friends, if you haven't signed up in the greatest charity event of all time, you'd better hurry, too. You may make it possible for your own church or hospital... Or your school or club... Or any other recognized local or national charity to share in $100,000 in cash. Tell them how simple it is to enter, Harlow. Why, all you do is sign your name and address on a registration form at any Autolite family car dealer. There's nothing to try or buy, nothing to solve or write. But if you're one of the 25 persons selected, you will name any recognized charity you wish to share in $100,000. So visit any or all of these car showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. There's not much time left to enter the Autolite family charity drawing. So why not sign up tomorrow? And now, Autolite presents Mr. David Niven in Grand Theft, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Here's how it works. You appraise things. You stroll through a house, take your notes, make your calculations, and eventually you come up with some interesting figures on which they pay you. Of course, it's interesting work. And if one is resourceful and competent and ambitious when no one is looking, one might turn out to be wealthy. Oh, oh there you are, Mr. Bentley. Oh, I was afraid you might get away. Oh, no, my dear Mrs. Payne, just waiting to say goodbye to you. Oh, Mr. Bentley. Oh, Mrs. Payne. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you did wait to say goodbye. I feel I've really come to know you these last three days, while you've been on our home appraising all of our goods. And I to know you, dear Mrs. Payne. Oh, I really must hurry now. My plane leaves in an hour. Uh, Mr. Bentley, I know you've seen many lovely homes in your line of work. Uh, uh, what do you think of ours? Oh, one of the loveliest I've ever seen. Oh, truly, Mrs. Payne. Uh, did, did the insurance company ask you to appraise the jewelry, too? No, no, they didn't, uh, Mrs. Payne. Oh, oh, dear. Well, we had such a delightful chat while you were here, and I do feel I know you. You did see my bracelet, the platinum one at dinner last night? Oh, I couldn't help but notice it, Mrs. Payne. Uh, well, it's a matter of curiosity, and I, I know you do have this knowledge. What do you think Roger paid for it? Well, not a cent under $5,000. Oh! Then he does love me. Oh, be most assured of that, Mrs. Payne. Oh, I really must go now. Uh, well, whenever you're in Denver again, call us, won't you? <laughs> won't you, Mr. Bentley? Well, of course I will. Goodbye, Mrs. Payne. You say goodbye. You take a cab to the airport, get on an airplane, and try to forget her fat face on the way to New York. However, once there, in a little pawn shop you know of on 3rd Street, that face looms before you just for one painful second. Hi, Ben. Hi. Well, what you got this time? Let's see. Hmm, platinum, eh? So I understand. What's your price? Give you 1500 for the thing. Take it or leave it. <laughs> what? You didn't love her enough. I'll take it. That way is very small stuff. Cheesecake instead of caviar, if you will. No, one must broaden one's horizons, enlarge one's activities, launch into greater, more productive fields. In short, one must never be satisfied with $1,500. That would be decadent. Well, punctual as usual. Oh, I always like to make my little visits on time, Maud. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how is your dear old grandmother today? Hmm? Is she comfortable? She's as good as can be expected. 
When do we get the money? Soon. Very soon. Now, don't be impatient. I'm going to speak to the insurance adjuster later on today. But first, I'd like to speak to Mrs. Mullins seriously. She'll be the key person in this situation. Ben, wait. What? You and I, Ben, we're two of a kind, but Grandmother's not like us, and she doesn't know about us. I... All I want to do is just get enough money to get out of here and get married and go to Paris and forget everything. So do I, my dear. Well, whatever we do, I mean, does she have to be involved? Mm, only in a small way, love. She's old, Ben. She's never done anything wrong in her whole life. Look, when you talk to her, be gentle. For some reason, she thinks the sun rises on your shoulders. Why, I don't know. Well, your granny is a woman of supreme taste. You might as well come along. Oh, a terrible house. Ghastly knickknacks. It's all she has left in her life. These things, her memories. Too bad she doesn't have any money any longer. She broke her glasses yesterday. They're being fixed. You have a visitor, Grandmother. Mrs. Mullen? Mrs. Mullen? Ah, uh, Granny, Granny dear, good morning. Ben, it's a wonderful morning, Ben. Yes, it is, dear. Have you been enjoying yourself? You're looking well. Oh, Ben, it's such a lovely morning. Dear, I've uh, something to talk to you about. Will you listen carefully, dear? Ben, be gentle. Sometimes she'll answer, sometimes she won't, but she hears you. What is it, Ben? Now, I want you to be a very good girl and do as I ask you, dear. Y yes, Ben. Sooner or later, possibly before the end of this week, a man will call on you. Yes? Now, I don't know his name, but he will represent an insurance company. Now, he will ask you certain questions about some family jewellery. Do you remember about the family jewellery? Do you remember what I told you about the family jewellery, Mrs. Mullen? Granny? Yes, I remember, Ben. What did I tell you? Um, Maud's grandfather gave it to me. Then I gave it to Maud when she was 21, and she's had it ever since, uh, until it was stolen from her. Very good, dear, very, very good. And that is exactly what you will tell this man when he comes here. He'll ask you all about it. Yes, Ben. What's this all about? I thought the claim was all right. Oh, it's just that I'm going to stir things up a bit. An insurance adjuster's bound to get here in the next day or two. He'll talk to you too, Maud. You know what to tell him. Ben, are we going to get in trouble? Shh. Now, no one's going to get into any trouble as long as dear old Granny does what she's told. B ben, dear. Yes, Granny, dear? There never was any jewelry in this family, Ben. Never. I've never told a lie, Ben. Never in my life. You just say what I told you to say, dear, and everything will be fine. You judge the picture of an old woman who never lied, and you wonder about it. But you feel that the larger gain, the promise of it, the Paris of it, the unutterable delight of being financially exhilarated, demands that you continue the action. So you make a phone call to a certain insurance company. Then you go home and await developments. Oh, I uh, believe you called Great Atlantic Underwriters yesterday about a claim. I did. The people who made it uh, asked me to find out what's delaying the matter. I'm from Allied Adjustment Bureau, Mr. Bentley. Great Atlantic turned it over to me. My name's Coombs. I'm happy to know you, Mr. Mr. Coombs. Come in. Oh, thank you. I uh, just took a chance and thought I'd drop by this morning. I'd like to ask you some questions about the claim, if I may. Party name of Mullen, uh, uh, Maud Mullen? Yes. Look, I'm uh, just getting ready for an appointment. I don't want to be late. Oh, be all right with me if you want to go on dressing while we're talking, Mr. Bentley. Well, it would be nice to get this settled for Miss Mullen. Yes. <clears throat> oh, I, uh, I see you paint. No, no, I don't paint, Mr. Coombs. Other people paint. I just collect paintings. Oh. <laughs> the pursuit of art is a natural activity with me. Paintings or any other work that I can put in my home. Anything to remind me that man is creative and not destructive. <laughs> now, let's see if I have all this right. Uh, Chalmers Bentley, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y, uh, uh, no initial? No. And uh, you're an appraiser, Mr. Bentley? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, how about now? Are you uh, with anybody now? No. No, different insurance companies call on me at different times to make appraisals. No, we're in the same business, Mr. Coombs. Different ends, of course. <laughs> I appraise fine objets d'art, rare household furnishings, jewellery, and... Well, Mr. Coombs, 
all of those things upon which the ordinary person would have no idea how to place a price. Does that answer you? Yes. Uh, uh, do you work in New York all the time? Most of the time. But, of course, I have to travel and sometimes even live away from here, wherever my work takes me. You uh, have any family here? No. What's on your mind? Is there something wrong with the uh, Mullen claim? Uh, you uh, reported the burglary for these people six weeks ago. You claimed that Maud Mullen was robbed of $18,000 worth of family jewelry, which you had assessed. The claim for the loss was filed three days later by you. And it should have been signed, sealed, and paid off by now, don't you think, Mr. Coombs? Well, ordinarily, it would have been paid by now, Mr. Bentley. Um, if I wore a tweed, do you think I could get by without a top coat? Oh, I think so. It's quite warm outside. Mm, I get so tired wearing a coat every time I go out, Mr. Coombs, don't you? <laughs> Excuse me. Now, what's holding up the claim? Uh, well, uh, several things. First, the burglary they reported. The police found no evidence of a forced entry in that old house of theirs. Oh, I know all that. But then I'm not a policeman. And I'm not the burglar. And it wasn't my jewellery that was stolen. So I can't very well tell the police where to find the evidence. Now, can I, Mr. Coombs? Well, it's a point to consider, Mr. Bentley. And you did file the claim for them. Oh, just as a favour. You keep mentioning that. There's uh, another point, too. I don't understand why they put a button in the back of some of these shirts. Can, can you get it for me, Mr. Coombs? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Now, as I understand it, uh, that jury had been in the Mullen family some 60 years. But in all that time, it had never been insured. Uh, now, they take out a policy three months ago, and just a month after your assessment, the jewelry's stolen. Uh, that strike you as something for us to look into, Mr. Bentley? No, no, not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, of course. Uh... Why didn't they insure it before, Mr. Bentley? No, oh, I don't know. I have no way of knowing. I see. Were you in Denver last month? Yes. Why? Appraise some things in the house of a family named uh, Payne. Payne. Yes, I believe that was their name. Yes. Did you know that uh, two days after you left, Mrs. Payne discovered a platinum bracelet missing? No, I didn't know. Well, I know. Uh, one of the companies I represent held the policy. Mr. Coombs, this has the flavor of an intimidating conversation. Why do you mention the incident in Denver? It has nothing to do with the claim of the Mullen family? Well, in a way it has, but I won't go into that right now. Oh. Mostly that's why the payment's been held up. We just want to look into it a little more. Mr. Coombs. Uh, yeah? I know you have your little task to perform, and the very nature of your work requires you to suspicion everyone and everything. However, I appraised the jewelry in the Mullen home. I saw something of the circumstances there. They asked me to file a claim for them. When I tell them what you've just told me, perhaps they'll ask me to notify the insurance commissioner. Well, of course you can do that for them, Mr. Bentley. That's what the insurance commissioner's there for. But uh, I I'll tell you what they'll be up against. We aren't convinced there was a burglary. And we aren't sure there was ever that much jewelry in the Mullen family. And if there was, and you assessed it, Mr. Bentley, uh, we aren't so sure that something like what happened to Mrs. Payne's platinum bracelet didn't happen to their stuff. Well, that's how it is. Goodbye, Mr. Bentley. Goodbye, uh, Mr. Coombs. Autolite is bringing you Mr. David Niven in Grand Theft. A story based on fact. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. During recent months, it has been Autolite's privilege to salute leading car manufacturer members of the Autolite family and their dealers throughout the world for many years of close association. Car dealers from coast to coast have held open house, and some 30,000 Autolite men and women have visited special automobile showings, set up in 26 Autolite plants. This third annual Autolite Family Salute program will be brought to a brilliant close with the opening this coming Wednesday of the famous Easter Parade of Stars automobile show in the Grand Ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Here, against a colorful background of thousands of living wild flowers, Record-breaking crowds will see latest car models produced by members of the Autolite family. If you are in New York City this week, we cordially invite you to the Easter Parade of Stars Auto Show at the Waldorf. And wherever you live, 
Remember, more than 400 Autolite products are famous throughout the world for outstanding quality and performance. Yes, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. David Niven in Elliot Lewis's presentation of Grand Theft, a story based on fact and well calculated to keep you in suspense. When one's problems become complex, one must rely on experience to carry one through. A suspicious insurance investigator can only operate on single-track theories. A resourceful insurance appraiser is quite aware of these methods and therefore regards them in the proper light. Naturally, one must be practical and bend all efforts to know where one stands. Ben. Well, Maud. I've been waiting for you, Ben. Mr. Coombs was at the house. Of course. He was here yesterday afternoon. I tried to call you to tell you about it, but you weren't in. He spent an hour with Grandmother talking to her. What do you ask her? What did she say? I don't know, Ben. You know how she is sometimes. She just won't talk to anybody, no matter what you ask her. Where were you? That's just it. I told him she was ill and might not understand him, but he insisted on talking to her alone. There was nothing I could do. It would have looked bad if I... <sighs> I've got to find out what she told him. Wait. No, not now. Something's happened to her. Right after Mr. Coombs left. Some sort of shock. The doctor doesn't know what it is. Wait till tonight. Maybe she'll be better then. No, Ben... Let go. I said I have to see her. Mrs. Mullen? Mrs. Mullen? Granny? Ben. Yeah, that's right, Granny. It's me. I want to ask you something, dear. It's um, important or I wouldn't have disturbed you. Is it a nice day, Ben? Oh, lovely day, dear, lovely. Mr. Coombs spoke to you yesterday afternoon about that little matter. Do you remember? Do you remember Mr. Coombs, Granny? Granny, tell me, did... Uh, what did he ask you? What did he say? Mr. Coombs? Oh, Ben, he was very, very nice. He smoked a pipe. Like Maud's grandfather. I, I told him all about the jewellery, the brooch, and the ring, and, uh, and the necklace. I, I told him he had been in the family 60 years, Ben, and that I gave it to Maud when she was 21. I is that right, Ben? Granny, that's exactly right, dear. Did he ask you anything else? Did you tell him anything else? That was all, Ben. That was all. Mm, now, you go back to sleep, dear. Sorry to have disturbed you. Ben? Yes, dear? There never was any jewellery in this family, Ben. Never. Of course there was, Granny. Didn't you tell Mr. Coombs all about it? Y yes, I told him. But, oh, Ben, I'm an old woman. And I shouldn't have lied. No, don't you worry, it's all right. <laughs> Maud? Well? Everything's all right. What? I'm telling you, we're in business, Paris and all. Pack your things. Well, wait, Ben. How is she? Your grandmother. Oh, my dear girl. We don't have to worry about her anymore. We'll put her in a nice home. Now, pack and smile. You sure we'll get the money on the claim? I'm going over to get it now. Now you finish it off. Of course, there never was any jewellery, even though I assessed some. And there never was any theft, even though one was reported. However, there was a claim that in any adjuster's eyes would, on the evidence of it, appear to be absolutely legitimate. Oh, glad you came by, Mr. Bentley. I was going to phone you. This will save time. That is precisely why I'm here, Mr. Coombs, to save time. When will the Mullins receive their money? Well, I'm afraid that's something I can't answer, Mr. Bentley. Mr. Coombs, a valid claim has been placed with the company you represent. And I'm sorry they have so many reservations about honouring it. However, I know something of the workings of insurance companies. I know that you, not the company, are holding it up. That's quite right. Why? I understand that you had the effrontery to call on that poor, sick old lady. Hmm. Wonderful person. I doubt if many people call on her nowadays. Most of her friends must be dead by now. I'll tell you why I'm here. Miss Mullen asked me to come. 
She wants her $18,000, Mr. Coombs. The policy was written. The money is owed now. Where My is grandmother it? made a sworn statement. All checks out there. Well, you're satisfied then. Mr. Bentley, I want to tell you something. Now, this is off the record. It's just between you and me. Now, when I was at your apartment the other day, I couldn't help noticing uh, the stuff on the wall. And I, uh, I just asked around. You know, some of those paintings in your place are worth two, three thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. Even for a man who gets paid as high as you do. Now, uh, what am I leading up to? Well, just this. Uh, not only the Denver thing, but you worked a case in Dayton, Ohio, a year and a half ago. Pray some things for, a, for Midwestern indemnity at the home of some people named Vansing. Do you remember Vansing? Now, two days after you'd done your work, the Vansings found out that a diamond ring worth $8,500 was missing from their house. I see. No, yeah. just, just let me go on. A uh, similar thing happened in Omaha three years ago. A family named Van Cleve reported 6000 worth of jewelry missing. It happened that you appraised their household goods just a week before. Now, uh, here's one from San Francisco, and there's another one from St. Paul. Uh, you see? You talk as though you expected to find stolen jewelry hanging on the walls of my apartment. No, no, but jewelry can be turned into money to buy paintings, can it? Oh, none of these things are any of my business. Even those nice paintings hanging in your apartment are none of my business. I have nothing at all to do with these people and their $18,000 claim with us. Now, as you said, Mr. Coombs, all of this has nothing to do with their claim. They want their $18,000, Mr. Coombs. They want it within 24 hours. Do you understand? Well, yeah, that's pretty clear, Mr. Bentley. But you can tell them they're going to be disappointed. You see, it's out of my hands. What? I turned the matter over to the federal district court. I've asked them to find the insurance company not liable under the policy. But it take weeks for a hearing. Well, I'm afraid so. And if the court decides against them, Mr. Bentley, the grand jury will have grounds to indict you for an attempted insurance fraud. Oh, oh, that's a, that's a pretty rough thing to beat. But now, if I had a statement from you right now, we might consider withdrawing from the court and letting the entire matter drop. I see. Well, what do you say, Mr. Bentley? Do you... Uh, Want to make that statement and clear all this up? Mr. Coombs, I'm due on Long Island at 2 o'clock, an appraisal job for Eastern States underwriters. They called me this morning. I'm late now. Mm -hmm. Then you don't want to make the statement. Mr. Coombs, I, I simply wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> You really do know what to say, but under the circumstances, it would be inadvisable to confide it to Mr. Coombs. Two words suffice. Get out. What had looked good and promising and Parisian had suddenly turned into an ugly accusation of theft, which was not the case, but which did definitely close the door on $18,000. So, one more crack at the old game, and if you have to, Paris alone. Uh, would you care for tea or a drink? Oh, Mrs. Prescott, I'm in rather a hurry. Thank you. Some other time. Oh, you've been so efficient, going from room to room, wandering all over the house. I'll just wager not one single object escaped your eye. Oh, uh, did you happen to notice my daughter's diamond earrings? Aren't they lovely? Her graduation present. Earrings? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, lovely. Yes. Yes, I believe I did notice them. You see, we do have to be very thorough, Mrs. Prescott. You understand that. No, oh, of course, of course. Um, tell me, Mr. Bentley, uh, did you see my son's bedroom? Yes, I believe so. Second door to the right, top of the landing. Uh, yes. Um, did you happen to see that little uh, jade vase? The jade vase? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Bentley, I, I know this is asking for information that should come officially from the insurance company, but uh, what is it worth? Forty dollars. Forty dollars? Oh, dear, and I thought it was worth thousands. I bought it in Hong Kong. What did you pay for it? Forty dollars. <laughs> Just goes to show you. <laughs> Are you sure you won't have any tea or something? Uh, quite sure. If you'll excuse me. Good day, Mrs. Prescott. Oh, good day, Mr. Bentley. I do hope you'll come back again someday. I want to talk to you about your work. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Hello? Huh? Mr. Bentley, this is Detective Ivers. Central Division, Mr. Bentley. What is this? Mr. Coombs, have you lost your mind? Your full something? name, Chalmers Bentley? Well, of course it is. He knows that. Say, I understand your occupation is appraising, that right? It certainly is. Now, I have a Just question. Just a minute. I'd like to see that briefcase, Mr. Bentley. What? Sorry. 
I'll put it all back. You're behind this, Coombs. I bet you think what'll happen when I call my attorneys. Oh, it's just a little idea, Mr. Bentley. I, I had to risk it. Nothing in here. Nothing but a day's work, all unassorted, thanks to you. Sorry. Mind standing still? I certainly do. Now, take your hands off me. I've got authority to search your person, Mr. Bentley. It'll be done sooner or later. What are you looking for, a gun or something? We have reason to believe you've taken some jewelry from this home. That's why I looked over the briefcase. That's why I have to search you. <sighs> Empty your pockets. In the hat. Hold still. Nothing. Hmm. Can you finish it downtown? Now, see here. I've been subjected to just All about right, enough of this. It's not a necklace or a bracelet. We'd have found it by now. It's something smaller, a ring or a pin, or maybe you just pulled something out of a set. But it's on you somewhere, in your shoe or taped under your arm or somewhere. Come on, now, what did you take this time? Diamond earrings. Where are they? Here. Right under my belt. This would have paid for my passage to Paris. You're very good at your job, Mr. Coombs. From an expert, that's a real compliment. Okay, let's get in the car. Wait, Mr. Coombs. Mm hmm. How did you find out? Why, um, I talked to your girlfriend's grandmother. Oh, I don't understand. I wanted you to talk to her. She was my ace. Oh, she told us the right story, Bentley. Uh, your story. <laughs> it broke that old lady's heart to lie. It just broke it. That's how we found out. Yeah, I'll bet that old lady never told a lie in her whole life before. Why? <laughs> A two-year-old kid would have known she was lying. Yes, I should have thought of that. You never can trust these beginners. <sighs> should have worn my top coat. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. David Niven. Say, Harlow, just who's eligible to enter the Autolite family charity drawing? Anyone and everyone, 18 years or over, Hap. And just what do you have to do, Harlow? Why, Hap, it's as simple as signing your name and address. In fact, that's all you do. Just visit any Autolite family car dealer showroom, sign your name and address to a registration form, and nothing more. There are no sentences to complete, no puzzles to solve, nothing to try or buy. If you're one of the lucky 25 persons selected, you will name any recognized local or national charity you wish to share in $100,000 in cash. It costs nothing to enter. So give your favorite charity this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to collect thousands. Visit one or all of these car dealers, DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Not much time left, so sign up tomorrow. Next week, the story of a man whose welcome home party promised little gaiety and many tears, and surely, his death. It's called Parole to Panic. Our star, Mr. Broderick Crawford. And that's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Grand Theft was written for Suspense by E. Jack Newman. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Maud, Florence Walcott as Grandmother, and Joseph Kearns as Coombs. Featured in the cast were Truda Marson, Paula Winslow, and Vic Perrin. David Niven may soon be seen in The Love Lottery. And remember, next week, Mr. Broderick Crawford in Parole to Panic. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>